welcome everyone to this webinar. It's one of a series of webinars. Uh, we've been doing webinars on various topics around, mostly around governance, but also some around management. Um, in this workshop, this webinar is really focused more on management rather than um, rather than governance. And um, want to invite you to check out all these webinars uh, at your at your convenience. They're all archived on the Nakui website. Uh, and if they're not, they will be very soon. The more current ones, it takes a little while to get them archived. Um, but they are there to be viewed and to share to share with your coworkers and your and the, your board members if you'd like to. I also want to point out that at this, on the screen here is my email address. Please feel free after this webinar, if you have any questions or comments or if you're look, looking for some resources, any way that you think I might be helpful to you, please feel free to reach out to me to the email address. I return all my emails. I respond within 24 hours for sure. And we also want to reiterate what Kimberly was saying, that if you do have any questions along the way here today, please type them into the question box and I'll do my best to figure out how to find them and read them and share them with folks. And if I have a hard time with that, Chelsea's going to will read them out loud for us. And I guess the final introductory comment I'd like to make is that all of these webinars are being evaluated. And so when we complete today's webinar, um, you will be receiving an email with a link to an evaluation form. And I want to encourage everyone to please take the time and give us your feedback. We welcome all feedback, positive and negative. We're looking at, at ways to continually improve um, the webinars that we're doing. We're also looking for new ideas for topics that you may uh, want to explore. So please feel free uh, and feel very much encouraged to do that and to uh, go to that link and do the survey. And if you have any great ideas, please feel free to sh share them. We look at everything that you give us because we have a mind towards trying to always be improving our work. So today's webinar is really about dealing with challenging employees, and it's an interesting topic because one of the key is a ha which the what's the adjective we should be using here, and sometimes I use the word challenging employee, sometimes I use the word high maintenance employee, uh, troublesome employees. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to describe this. So we're talking about employees who seem to take a lot of your time and energy. And we're going to look at some ways in which you can um, perhaps learn some ways to deal with those kind of folks more effectively. So that's the area we're going to focus on today. Um, and um, the goal for today is to explore strategies and look at how we can deal with these challenging employees. I laid out an agenda for today. So we're looking at kind of a welcome introductions as we're doing now giving you a kind of an overview of what the webinar is about. We're going to focus some of our time on looking at effective supervisory practices. So before you, you have problems with an employee, we can look at some super supervisory practices that would be helpful to either uh, avoid or minimize <clears throat> those kind of challenges. And it has to do with this working relationship between the people you supervise and you. It has to do with having those difficult kind of conversations that we have to have sometimes and about giving feedback. <clears throat> we'll spend a little time talking about core competencies, those skills and qualities that are required and necessary for somebody to, do, to be effective in their particular job. We'll look at some of the reasons for poor performance uh, in an effort to really try and understand what's behind the performance problem. There's always something behind performance problems. We'll look at some specific kind of corrective actions that you can take if you have to take certain corrective actions with an employee. Um, we'll look at termination considerations. If things become really extreme um, and you need to consider terminating a, an employee, uh, and termination is another one of those euphemisms, I guess, but. When things get so bad that they're not going to work out for an employee, then, then we'll look at some considerations around that. And then finally, I thought it might be helpful to look at some general kind of information around conflict resolution. So the last couple of slides, they're really some gener generic kind of uh, thoughts about resolving conflicts. And then we'll evaluate the session, of course, and that's the tool that you'll get uh, when you go to the link that, that Kimberly will send out. So there really are, uh, as I plan this, three perspectives um, 
as we go through this webinar. Uh, and in some ways, let me share with you that there are some parallels here between being the supervisor and the supervisee. And one of the parallels is to look at the parent-child relationship. And I don't mean that in any disrespectful way, but the parent-child relationship is a way to help understand how to be effective as a supervisor. Uh, and again, in a way that uh, is really uh, respectful, I believe. Um, <clears throat> so in that case, you know, one of the perspectives is to look at the supervisor and the supervisee, the parent and the child, in a sense. And you know, we all know that if you have parent, if you have children, you they know that in these relationships, somebody has to be the adult. And it's the same in the workplace. If you're the supervisor, you're the one who has to be the adult. You're the one who has to be the leader in the relationship. So a lot of the information in today's webinar is going to be specific to this relationship between supervisor and supervisee. This could also mean, if you are a board member, for example, on this webinar, that you can look at this in terms of the board or the board chair being a supervisor and the executive director being a supervisee. So there are parallels here in uh, whether you're, on the, you're talking about the board or talking about in the workplace itself. The second perspective is again kind of following a parallel of child parent. It, it's a situ the parallel would be a parent with two or more children. So if you're a supervisor and you're supervising more than one person, let's say you're supervising two or three people, that there's some times when there's points of tension or conflict between two employees. And in that and from that perspective, you have to make some decisions about whether to intervene and if so, in what way might you intervene. So I want to incorporate some of that in today's webinar as well. And then finally, I want to go back to the supervisor-supervisee relationship, but with the caveat that it's a little bit different if you're in a small office setting. Uh, often when it's a small office setting and people have been there for a while, it, ha it takes on a family-like kind of quality. And that's something that's a potential strength, and it's also a potential weakness as well. So there are some unique challenges when you're working in an office where the office setting is small and kind of family-like. So those are the perspectives that, um, that we'll try to cover and incorporate throughout this webinar. And again, I will remind you, if, if you have questions that come up along the way, please enter them into that question box, and uh, I will do my best to respond. If you have questions that I can't respond in, in, a, in a thorough enough way, uh, I, give me your email and I will follow up with a little more of a thorough response. So if we're looking at troublesome employees or challenging employees, we can put it in a larger context and that context is supervision and effective supervisory practices. Working with the people who report directly to you to try to get to a level that's really honest as, as much as you can and to really focused on the need for you as a supervisor to be respected, not so much to be liked, but to be respected. It's nice if you're liked, but uh, res being respected is, is essential. The other part of this is that it's a working relationship. And working relationships tend to be very effective when the, when the boundaries are clear, when the roles are clear, when the expectations are clear. Uh, working relationships happen because people attend to them. In any working relationship, there's a requirement for somebody to be the leader. And as I was saying earlier in the, the analogy with parent and child, somebody has to be the leader, somebody has to be the parent in a sense. And finally, and most importantly, you have to always look at trust. It really is the lubricant in any relationship. Building trust takes time and energy. It can be eroded overnight very easily. So it's something we really have to put effort into over time. Um, it's particularly difficult to get to honest in a supervisor-supervisory relationship because there's a power differential. Uh, it would be really nice if, you're, if the person you supervise comes to you and they're totally honest, but it's not likely to happen. And so you want to strive at getting more and more honest and open um, with each other. It would be great for your employee to say to you, you know, I'm really doing poorly in this area and I need some support rather than to try to come to you and put on some airs like they're doing fine when in fact they may not be. So it's a challenge to do that because of the power differential. Um, the other thing about, I want to just comment somewhere and I'll do it right here, that when you're working with challenging employees, when there's some kind of problem in the workplace, 
the truth of it is that everybody knows it. Everybody feels it and everybody's probably affected by it. So it really requires somebody to have the courage to step up and, and take some kind of action. It will not go away by itself. We can look at an effective performance assessment process uh, in a way that, that if you have one of these in place, if you do a, a performance reviews of your, of your employees, of the people who report to you, if you do them a, on a regular basis, if you do them on a formal basis once a year, and if you do them well, it's going to provide a context for dealing with all these issues because it's the context we use for strengthening the supervisor-supervisee relationship. In, in the performance review process, it's the vehicle for keeping expectations clear and for ensuring that there's good accountability. It's also a time when you, you once a year when you would acknowledge and reward people for the things they've accomplished. So the performance review process is a larger context for thinking about working with challenging employees. And a key component to, to an effective performance assessment process is that there's a position description and that it's reviewed on a regular basis. And when you do this on a regular basis and review and revise, if need be, the, the person who reports to you, if you're doing that and revising their position description, it's always going to be accurate and complete and up to date. And the position description, if it's going to be really effective, the duties and responsibility need to be stated in terms of outcomes. So, so that's kind of a guideline for looking at a position description. I thought it'd be helpful to talk about some uh, some effective supervisory practices, things that you want to have in place, things that I've seen in other workplaces that I have found have been valuable, and things that I've learned from my own experiences as a supervisor and also as one who's been supervised. One of the best things you can do if you supervise people is to meet with them on a regular basis. Even if you're in a small office, very often people in a small office will say, well, we don't meet on a regular basis because we see each other day, every day and we touch base and we talk. Um, it's always a good practice to create some time, some space, set aside to just sit down and determine whether there's any major issues we need to talk about. If you do that once a week, for example, for 20 minutes, if you set that side of time, now that time aside, um, if you need 20 minutes to talk about an issue, you can do it. And if there's nothing you talk about, you can simply mutually agree that everything is fine and we don't need to meet. But setting the time aside is a good way to ensure that you get to this important part of your job. When you meet with somebody in a supervision session, it's really important that you give them your undivided attention. And what that looks like in reality is that they sit in your office, you close the door, you turn off their answering machine, you do not take phone calls, you don't take, you don't interrupt this time. When you give someone your undivided attention, it's the most respectful thing you can do, and it's the most valuable thing you can do for anybody, is to simply sit with them and give them your attention. Keeping notes is another good practice. When you meet with someone in supervision, uh, to take some notes about what you talked about, to make sure you document any decisions that get made, so you can be sure that we are, that both people are really on the same page. If you do performance reviews on a regular basis, and if you do a formal one annually, you would have some performance goals. Often the performance goals become a really good framework for your ongoing supervision, supervisor, supervisee meetings. Effective supervisory practices involve delegating responsibilities more so than tasks. Uh, it, it's a matter of saying to somebody, here's a job that needs to get done. Trust that they can do it. Give them the tools and the support they need to do it. And have them come back to you only if they need to, if, if they have a problem or if they are uh, need some support or some clarification. But delegating responsibilities is giving somebody the whole thing to take, to take responsibility for. And then you hold them accountable for whether they, um, whether they accomplish what you set, ask them to set out to accomplish. Nurture feedback, and it's always good to get feedback from people that, that are reporting to you. There should be no surprises when you're doing performance reviews. There should be no surprises in a supervisory meeting. Um, everyone should know what's going on, so you don't kind of hold back on things to save them up. If you have a concern with an employee, you bring it up, when it, you bring it up on, within a very short period of time. 
don't don't save it up till you've got a list that you want to go down of, of uh, performance problems, for example. And in all of it, you know, the work of the supervisor, the first way is to really try to understand what is going on with this employee. And if it's a problem of performance, to really start by trying to understand before you start making some uh, some judgment calls about it, to try and understand what's going on. And I want to add here one other thing that I think is really important, and that is if you delegate pe responsibilities for people, you have to be okay to a certain level, to a certain extent, with people making mistakes. In a lot of organizations, mistakes are rewarded. If people are making mistakes, and I don't mean crazy things, but just people make mistakes. If they're trying things out, if they're experimenting, if they're being creative in their work, it's very likely they'll make mistakes. Mistakes need to be rewarded. You never want to punish mistakes unless it's something egregious. Uh, punishing mistakes will just shut down the creativity. So paying attention to mistakes and not punishing people for their efforts for trying new things is a good practice. So that's kind of a list of some of what I see as some, some effective supervisory practices. I'm sure you all probably have uh, one that you could add to your list as well. Talk a little bit about giving feedback, and this slide pertains uh, in some ways more to toward um, the kind of feedback you give to a peer. So this may involve uh, a conversation between two coworkers. Um, it's one of those other perspectives that I was talking about earlier. The other thing about giving feedback in this kind of setting is that um, it's more kind of about peers and. Um, and you want to do it in a way where you, you have a dialogue. So you don't want to say or do things to get people to shut down. So when you're giving somebody feedback, it's really helpful to be descriptive rather than evaluative. Simply describing the, the behavior that's troubling to you rather than making a, a judgment about that behavior. And to be specific, if somebody's performance um, is, is a problem or someone's behavior is a problem, Talking to them about it in general terms and then citing an example of what you're talking about is a good way to help people understand exactly what the issue is that's on your mind. And that's why we use I language, which is another way uh, to, inject, to, that, to not engender a defensive reaction. You don't want the employee to get defensive because when people get defensive, they shut down and stop listening. You want them to be open to hearing what it is that you have to say. Another kind of thing, it's so obvious that we miss it sometimes, and that's to acknowledge feelings. If we tend to, to not do this uh, before we realize it. And I go back to the, the parallel of parents and children. Uh, you know, I, I know when my daughter was small, she would, she would say, I'm bored. And my first response was always, how can you be bored? We, have, we buy you all these toys. You have all these things to do. We take you places. How could you be bored? Well, the truth is, if my kid says she's bored, She's feeling bored. And I simply need to acknowledge, okay, so you're feeling bored. Uh, to deny feelings is something that you easily do if we're not paying attention. And it can be really problematic. Um, so I wanted to put that in there as well. Directing the conversation to the behavior that the receiver, that the receiver can do something about. So if you're talking to a, a, one of your employees about a particular behavior, you want to, you want to direct the conversation to, to the behavior that it's something they can do something about. Timing is important. Giving feedback when it's least threatening. Um, often you don't have to respond to some performance problem immediately. You can take some time and reflect on it and think about it. Um, most of the time, responding to some performance problem is best done in private between two people in a confidential setting. Um, you don't want to be uh, addressing problem behaviors or performance problems in public, in a sense, in front of other, of other uh, employees. Summarizing uh, to ensure that there's a clear communication. So did you make your point clearly? Did, you receive, did the receiver understand that? So you'd be saying to your employee, do you understand what I'm saying here? Do you see what the point is? And summarizing that to make sure that they get what it is that's troubling you. Avoid dumping or overloading. 
this is not the time to go down a laundry list of dumping a bunch of stuff on an employee. Simply focus on a particular behavior that may be problem, uh, problematic or troublesome. I put avoid the why question here because human nature, most of us really want to know why somebody did something. It's really hard to get at the why and often even when you figure out the why, it doesn't lead you to, to a solution. Uh, it can be a path you can go down and it can be not very fruitful. So, <clears throat> so it's a question that may not matter all that much. And then all of the feedback conversation focusing on the future. An employee has a problem with their performance, you simply state what it is um, and you focus on what can we do to deal with this performance problem so we, you can improve your performance. It's about correcting the problem in a sense and improving performance. It's not simply being critical of somebody. So those are some thoughts about ways in which giving feedback could be, could be uh, effective. Framing the discussion. This, this, this slide really talks about you as a supervisor observing two employees where there's some tension or conflict. And, you know, if, I, I mean, let me rephrase that. This, this is a, a perspective where you are in a more parallel or uh, equal relationship. So this would be if you are a coworker. So if you're a coworker and your coworker is doing something that's problematic for you, simply starting by asking if you can give feedback and is this a good time to do it and really honoring what the person's response might be. Stating your intention. Here's why I want to talk to you about this particular behavior. Ask if the person has any questions or responses. So once you state the, the behavior and what's troubling about it, ask them if they understand, ask them if they have any questions, and then really listen. Give them the opportunity to explain to you what's going on. It's the, it's the whole notion of you seeking to understand. Set up a future time to continue the discussion if it's necessary or appropriate. Um, and respect the person for hearing you out. And finally, thank the person for listening. Um, if you do this, you're really bringing greater intention into the conversation. And, it, and these kind of guidelines are really helpful in those situations where it's more of a peer relationship rather than a supervisor supervisee relationship. Talk a little bit about attending to the relationship. And again, it's important to keep in mind that any problems you have with a challenging employee, somehow you are probably implicated in it. Um, very often I'll talk to a, a, an executive and he or she will be saying, I have such a problem with this employee, she does this and that and this. And my, my instinctive response is, who hired this person? How was it that this person came into your organization? Uh, how is it that this problem has been going on for a long time and you haven't intervened yet? Looking at the way you might be implica implicated as the supervisor is the first stop. It's the first place to go in any of this work. There are some problems that re resolve themselves. Very often, they just take care of themselves. So because an employee had some kind of perform performance issue or exhibit a particular behavior at some point, you do not necessarily have to intervene. To, to act or to not act should be a conscious choice. Every time you do intervene, you really preclude the employee from resolving the issue himself or herself. So as soon as you step in, the space for them to resolve it themselves is, not, is gone and you're in it. <clears throat> Attending to the relationship is about perspective, trying to help bring perspective to what's going on. Sometimes the challenging employee issue is one that's developmental. And I'll share with you an example of this from my experience. I had a person who worked for me of uh, uh, my age, so she was at the time in her 50s and I was at the time about my 50s, so we were two grown-ups, experienced people, capable people, and I had a real difficult time with this employee uh, in supervising her. And when I reflected more on this, I came to the realization that this employee really was at some, in some ways in an adolescent developmental stage. And again, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but in some ways, this person was an adolescent. And that's when a light bulb went off for me and I realized, if I'm going to communicate to an adolescent, I have to do that in a way that's different than communicating to somebody who's more mature or older. Uh, so I had to be much more specific. 
I had to be more directive with this person. Um, I had to really be clear about what I expected from her. And, and she was the kind of person that there was a supervisee that needed more hands-on kind of um, supervision. So once I figured out where she was developmentally, I could develop some kind of developmentally level appropriate ways of uh, supervising her. So getting a sense of where the person is is often a good, a good strategy. Uh, sometimes when you're working with an employee where the performance is a problem or the behavior is a problem, you've got to figure out whether this person is in a rational place or an irrational place. If somebody is really acting in a way that's irrational, it's virtually impossible to have a dialogue with them, to have a conversation. If you're speaking in the language of rationality and they are speaking in a language of emotion, those two horses will not hitch, they will not connect. So you have to kind of just help the person get to a place where they can be rational and then you can have a conversation that can be productive. It's one of those things too where people will always advise you in the heat of the moment you're not going to communicate effectively. So often it's a good idea to just take a little time and decompress and then address the issue. And problems in, in all these cases, I, I'll use an iceberg analogy and I'll share that with you in a couple of slides. But the basic idea is that the, the problem that you're dealing with is probably the tip of an iceberg and you have to get at the underlying stuff, the bigger part of that iceberg which is under the surface. That's where problems of performance come from almost all the time. And acknowledging feelings, that's what you do when you're attending to the relationship. So as you look at any position, there are certain core companies competencies that people need to have in order to be effective in their job. So one is the area of knowledge. They need to know stuff that's specific to your mission and to your organization. They need particular skills and these skills are typically technical and some of them are transferable skills. An experience. What have you done? What have you learned? And I would submit to you that these three core competencies, if you compare them to the iceberg, these are the tip of the iceberg. There's also the notion of self-concept, how the person sees themselves, their level of self-awareness, their ability to manage themselves in a work environment. Motivation is another important competency that's part of the under-the-surface part. Why does this person want this job? Why this job in relation to any other jobs? And then there are personal traits, and the personal traits are things that really can make or break any person's, any job or any working relationship. And these have to do whether the person tends to be introverted or extroverted, if they're self-directed or not, uh, depends on their world view. And by world view, I mean, you know, some people see the glass half empty and some see it half full. And if everyone in your office sees the glass half full and one employee sees it half empty, there may not be a good fit there. So these are the six kind of core competencies that people need to master in some ways in order to be effective in their job. And I put up on the screen now my very poor attempt at, um, at doing graphic art and a PowerPoint um, presentation. But if you're looking, what you're looking at in blue is the iceberg. And you have the surface of the water and below the surface we have those three core competencies around self-concept, motivation, and personal traits. And it's in those areas where people have problems in the workplace. If you keep this uh, in mind as we proceed, you'll see that, that these are issues that, um, in a sense, you can do nothing about. If somebody is up here and they need a particular skill in order to do the job, you can teach them the skill if they're motivated and if they're smart enough, and as most people are. Uh, but there are certain personal qualities and personal traits you can't teach people. They come to the job with them. And they are often the place where you have problems. When you think about a challenging employee, it's because of something below the surface here. So we look at reasons for poor performance. And this is just some reason why you might have an employee whose performance is poor. They may have lost the sense of purpose. They may not see that what they do in, your, in that job is making any real difference. So it's something to be particularly attentive to. Um, you want to make sure that if it's a frontline person in your office that they see that they're on the front lines, that they're one of the most important people in your agency. If you're running a health clinic, 
your frontline people are the ones who are the real ambassadors. They're the ones closest to the customer, closest to the client. If they feel like they don't have a sense of real purpose, if they don't feel connected to your mission, they're not going to perform well. Typically, um, problems of performance do not have to do with lack of skills or knowledge, as I mentioned earlier. Most jobs can be done successfully if somebody's motivated and intelligent. Most problems of poor, poor performance really come from there being unclear expectations. And again, you go back to the basic tools we have. If you have a good job description, it should be pretty explicit about what the expectations are of this job, that the duties and responsibilities are spelled out in terms of outcomes. Skills can be learned. Personal quality cannot be learned. So it's an important thing to keep in mind. When you're hiring people, it's important to get at those personal qualities to determine whether the person you're hiring is a good fit for your organization. The personal qualities are what they bring to the job, things that you can't teach someone. Some examples of personal quality. Honesty. There's a perfect example. You cannot teach someone to be honest. You could have the most capable bookkeeper in the world, but if they're not honest, you don't want them working for you. Integrity. People, you, you want to hire people and support people in the workplace who do what they say they're going to do. Being a team player is another example. You can't teach someone to do that. They either are or they aren't. They work well together with others. Someone has a sense of humor. You know, you don't want a lot of negativity in the workplace. If having a sense of humor is important to being successful in your workplace, then you want to, in your hiring, make sure you hire people who do have that. And worldview, as I said earlier, there are some people that tend to be kind of negative. Um, negativity is contagious. Positivity, if it is such a word, um, is also contagious. And that's what you want to bring into the workplace and nurture and cultivate in the workplace. Now, if you're working in a situation where you've got a, a troublesome employee, you have to take some corrective actions. This next slide kind of lays out some things that you might consider. All problems start with a, with a with, they don't start with a capital P. I guess that's a typo. Problems begin with a lowercase p. They can become a capital P. Uh, so a small problem can become a big problem very quickly, and a big problem can become a crisis before you know it. So keep in mind that you're starting with a small problem most of the time. Um, being articulate about the problem. If you're going to take a corrective action, you have to really articulate what is this problem. You have to articulate your expectations of the, of the employee. Being specific and concrete is the best way to do that. As I mentioned earlier around uh, people and what developmental stage they would be in, being specific and concrete ensures that at whatever developmental stage somebody is at, they will understand what you're talking about. Focus on behaviors versus attitude. I always use the term stick to the data. What is it that's observable? For example, your report was late is a behavior. You are a procrastinator is really an expression of a value. Um, it's shaming or blaming. Sticking to the behavior is really key. If you have to take a corrective action, you want to put it in writing. It's very important to document the, the, the corrective actions. And follow your HR policy. They're there to guide you. They're there to protect you and your organization. If you have to take a corrective action with an employee, follow your HR policy. And if you don't think your HR policies are up to, up to snuff, now is the time, not when you're in the middle of a problem, now is the time to review them to make sure that they really are good and will be useful to you in the future. Ultimately, if you have a troublesome employee or a challenging employee, you will, will ultimately come to a point where you may consider terminating them. So the first kind of fork in the road when you're considering to terminate or to not terminate is to determine where you're going to invest your time and your energy as a supervisor. If you could choose to either invest in helping this person correct their behaviors and improve their performance, or you could choose to invest your time and energy in getting them out of the workplace as quickly as possible. So the first fork in the road is to decide which way you're going to go with this employee. Seek expert advice. 
all of this comes down to making sure you're doing things in a way that, that are not only ethical and com conform with your core values as an organization, but that they're also legal. Because terminating somebody is a legal action you will take, and it can have consequences that can affect your organization. So you want to make sure you do it in a way that's, that's ethical and legal. Acting sooner versus later. There's an expression in the, in the Eastern world that pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. Um, it's really important that if, if you determine that you are going to terminate somebody, that you do it sooner rather than later, um, to not drag out the pain until it becomes suffering. And if somebody's performing poorly in the workplace, everyone knows it, and if it's very bad, everybody's going to be feeling the pain. What's required is, is a leader to stand up and take the action that needs to be taken, and that really means you need to find the courage to do that. And I'll share an anecdote with you here of one of my experiences, um, which was not all that positive an experience, and a great lesson in life for me. But I had a, an employee who worked for me, who reported directly to me, and this person's performance got worse and worse, and I continued to not address it. And it went on for at least six months. And everyone in my office could feel the tension and the pain. Uh, no one was happy. This was an employee that needed to leave and was actively looking around, which I didn't know at the time, but was looking for a job. But she needed to leave. And if I were to act in the best interest of the organization, I should have terminated her uh, sooner than later. And I never did. Uh, and it's because I didn't have the courage. And, and at that point in my life, I was relatively new to supervising people. And it was a difficult thing for me to do, and so I avoided it, as we do when we're humans. And um, you know, the upshot of it at all is she eventually left because she found another job. And as a result of my lack of courage and leadership at the time, uh, I put her and me and everyone who worked for the agency in a painful place for a long period of time. So the, again, I was a, there was a mistake there. I look back, there's lessons I've learned, and those lessons now inform my work going forward. Termination, kind of recapping it, you want to follow your HR policy. And typically, they're stated in incremental terms. So if someone's, perform, someone's performance is starting to become a problem, the first, the first course of action is to sit down and have a conversation. And that's a private heart-to-heart -heart conversation about what it is. What is that behavior? Be explicit, specific, concrete, put it out there. The next step is if the behavior doesn't change, then you want to issue a verbal warning. So you can see you start ratcheting up what you're doing here. And you're moving from informal to more and more formal. If after a verbal warning there isn't a change of the behavior, then you need to have a written warning documentation of the behavior and the corrective action plan to address it and then over time the corrective action plan will be successful or it won't. So typically HR policies and I'm sure yours follow this kind of a pattern. If they don't it would be good to revisit them and, uh, and get some advice from some HR experts around how to have a good process in place for dealing with troublesome behaviors in the workplace. And finally, you know, grievance procedures, that's another way in which when somebody has a grievance, there's got to be a way for them to express that grievance. And it has to be a way that's, that's respectful, but also follows a protocol. Another quick thought I have about termination, too, is that very often if you hire somebody, you probably have a probationary period. And that's really the kind of time to get a sense of how this person is going to work out and if it's going to be a good fit and can they actually do the job and so on. It's a good way to get a sense of what's below that iceberg. And in the probationary period you have a little more latitude around terminating someone. Um, once you get past the, term, the, the probationary period it becomes a little more difficult and it's more important to pay attention to the law and to your HR policies. If you end up in a position where you have to terminate somebody, you ought to be able to say in a sentence why you're terminating them. And that sentence has to be accurate, it has to be honest, and it has to be true. 
So you need, you need to be able to say it in a sentence that's accurate, honest, and true. And that it's based on behavior, something that's observable. That's something that has to do with a performance indicator. Something that rises to a level that it's, that it, it's serious and that actions have been taken and it cannot be corrected. <laughs> So when we get into this area, we're really in that territory where um, you have to be very thoughtful about protecting your organization its res its, and its assets, its reputation. There's some reasons why a supervisor doesn't act when they ought to. So uh, this, for me, is kind of um, the challenge to, for some people, the challenge that are unique to working in a smaller organization. Where, where you as a supervisor may have your priorities confused. If you're an executive director of an agency and you've got four or five people that report to you and one of them's performance is really not up to speed, your job is to correct that and to get that person performing better and to do it in a respectful way but in a way that's serious. It's got to happen. And what gets confused often because in smaller organizations people get to know each other and it is very personal um, that there's a confusion between caring for somebody, caring about a person or caring for someone or taking care of them. And to share with you an example, um, I, I want to look at another reason why supervisors don't act all incorporated here and that's their fear. When I didn't act in my example, it's because I was afraid. I was afraid I would hurt somebody's feeling. I was afraid that I would be disliked. Um, I was afraid of the unknown. I didn't know what was going to happen. So I share with you now an anecdote with one of my clients that I work with, work, which illustrates this whole uh, this whole issue. There was a this woman worked in an office. She was the executive, and she had five people report to her. And one of them, the performance was very poor. It it get it'd be getting progressively worse and worse. And the executive director. Um, was working with me in a coaching relationship, so I would talk to her every month on, by telephone. And she told me about this uh, um, this employee, and you know, we had a conversation about she needed to act on this, even if she was somewhat fearful, because her job was to rise to the uh, to put this acting acting in the best interest of the organization above all other considerations. What was difficult for this executive is that she knew this person personally. She cared very much about this person. The person who was a troublesome employee was a single mom. Uh, she was living economically on the edges. She needed this job. She needed child care. And all those concerns and all that caring for that person, as, as legitimate as that is, gets in the way or got in the way of this executive acting on this. This employee needed to be terminated and it took literally six months before this was ever resolved and it was resolved in, because that employee found another job and left. So it parallels my experience in that the executive should have, act, should have acted, should have acted in the best interest of the employee um, and, and didn't for various reasons. And sometimes what gets confused here is we think that to terminate somebody is somehow disrespectful. And I would submit to you that to keep an employee in a job that they're not doing well at, where they're feeling unsatisfied and painful perhaps, and, and where their performance is affecting everyone and affecting your organization and your ability to, do, to advance your mission, to, to terminate that person is a respectful thing to do if you do it in a respectful way. Very difficult stuff to do, uh, but sometimes it needs to happen. And if you're the executive director or you're an executive who's supervising folks, your job is to make difficult decisions sometimes. And what we're talking about today, dealing with challenging employees, is very much one of those difficult decisions. So you want to keep focused on the best interest of the organization. It's in the best interest of the organization for every employee to be working at their maximum and to be feeling good about their work and what they're doing and that they're getting the support they need so they can still feel good in their job and feel successful and help be part of and move the mission forward. And you always want to align your actions with your values. As I was saying, it's about defining respect. Um, to keep someone in a position where they are no longer happy or could be successful is simply to drag out something 
and, and moves from crossing the line from being painful to being suffering. So it's incumbent upon the person who is the leader, the supervisor, to take the action they need to take uh, in order to advance the organization forward. So those are some of the challenges and some of the ways of thinking about working with a challenging employee as we kind of define them in general terms. Um, I want to remind you all that if you do have a question, please type it into the question box and I'll do my best to answer. And again, if you have if you don't have a question now, you can reach me by email, which I'll put up here at the end of this webinar. Feel free to email me with a question or comment anytime. The last two slides here are to kind of lay out some general kind of um, steps in resolving conflict. So this comes basically from general conflict resolution practice. Uh, and I thought it would be good to add this here because it will give you um, kind of a broader kind of context around managing conflicts in the workplace. So one is, there's eight steps here. Number one is identify the conflict. conflict. So you're looking for, a, for signs of a serious conflict. You're not talking about little differences of opinion. You're talking about tensions that may rise to a level of conflict. Um, and they're typically not one-time events. They're typically patterns of behavior. You have to decide whether to intervene or not. To, to, that's the first decision all the time. And if it's, in general speaking, uh, if you're the supervisor, you would be the person to intervene. There are some settings where uh, bringing in somebody else to intervene might be a better might be a better choice. But you can consider all those different options. Identifying the parties, the issues, and the emotions. This is basic conflict resolution practice. Identifying who's involved in this conflict, what are those issues, and what are the emotions that are driving this. Analyzing the conflict to really get a sense of who has what power in this in this conflict. Um, very often, it may be between uh, a supervisor and supervisee. You see variations in uh, power in terms of men and women sometimes, uh, somebody who's younger or older. Some people, their personality may be kind of dominating, where others are a little more easily intimidated. So analyze the conflict to get a sense of what it's all about. Fifth is really to design a process. Plan the way that you're going to bring these two parties together so the conflict can get resolved. Uh, educating the parties and get agreement to participate. It's a way to build ownership into the process. Um, seven, conduct the process. It might be one meeting, it might be multiple meetings. Bring people together and again this slide just kind of depicts trying to figure out what's going on and how can we deal with this. And helping people understand that the conflict to continue is not good for anyone and it's certainly not good for the organization. And then finally, you know, if you're successful in doing this, then it's a matter of celebrating. You know, that, okay, we came together, we had a major conflict, we found a way to resolve it. We should praise each other for hard work and for the time set aside to deal with this, um, that we did it in a respectful way, that we had the courage to actually deal with it. Um, these are all things that need to be kind of acknowledged and celebrated. So those are eight kind of steps in conflict resolution, and I want to attribute that there uh, to Marion Peters and Angelica. Um, so this is stuff that you would find in any general conflict resolution materials. And I thought it would be a good way to kind of bring this, uh, this webinar to a conclusion. We really are looking at, uh, at ways of resolving things for the better. And if you're the executive uh, and you're dealing with employees with their problems, you absolutely have to get their performance improving and get them being part of the solution rather than part of the problem because that's the way you advance your mission. And then finally, we have a few minutes. I will continue to kind of invite you, if you have a question or a comment, to please type it into the question box, and, uh, and I would do my best to respond to it. So I'll give you all a minute to do that. And while you're reflecting on any thoughts or questions, uh, this is a good time for me to remind you that um, you can reach me at this email address down here anytime, and that if you uh, do have a question or comment, please reach out to me that way and that you will be receiving from Chelsea or from um, Kimberly uh, an evaluation, a link to an evaluation form. Please uh, do take the time to respond to that and share with us your perceptions of this webinar, um, things that worked well for you, things that didn't. Give us your honest, direct feedback so we can improve our performance as well. 
and seeing that there are no questions in the question box, if I'm reading it correctly, and I think I am, there are none, so I think uh, this would be a good time then we could wrap up this webinar. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to do this, and I appreciate if you happen to be somebody in one of these situations, I can honestly appreciate how difficult it is. I hope that nothing I said here oversimplifies it uh, or discounts the challenges that you have when you supervise other people. So thank you very much uh, again for attending.